Okay, so in the two minutes I have left, uh, let me uh, see what I can do. Uh, what I want to talk about is the uh, uh, essentially a, a, a thin slice of work that's going on through my group uh, at Hewlett Packard Labs. Uh, I presently uh, run a group which is called Foundational Technologies. This group has, has changed and morphed over the past two decades, but essentially what we're doing is uh, uh, weird science in some way. Uh, my group is actually part of a larger laboratory, so specifically within my group we do photonics and nanoelectronics, uh, primarily trying to figure out how to uh, uh, do things that are non-standard. Uh, we're not trying to replace uh, standard types of processing units, but we're trying to complement them, store data, and move data around quickly. Uh, within our laboratory, there's also a systems integration group with the idea that they take some of the stuff that we do and, and plug it together and make larger systems, and then also a system software group. And each of these groups are, are roughly the same size. <clears throat> if you look at, at our <clears throat> work specifically in what I'll call cognizant, cognizant systems, I mean, really, as, as everyone here knows, this requires a, a highly multidisciplinary approach in order to be able to go after these types of problems. Uh, we actually have two different pathways that we're uh, uh, moving on simultaneously. One is, is a completely software uh, type of approach where we have a, a platform called COGX Machina, which is a, uh, essentially uh, a, a software platform that has been set up explicitly to run uh, cognitive types of, of, of uh, algorithms. Uh, uh, for instance, I believe that the algorithm that you just heard about could probably be, be coded up in, in maybe a, a, a less than 20, 20 lines of code in, in, in COG uh, is the type of, of, of way that it's set up and then executed across a very large number of, of GPUs. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about, though, is on the hardware side where we're really looking at uh, uh, how we can uh, utilize some of these new nano devices and what types of improvements in performance we could achieve uh, and new types of, of functionality that we could get in order to be able to uh, uh, apply some of the uh, ideas that we're getting out of uh, uh, neural uh, systems and with the, with the eventual hope that the software and the hardware uh, join up uh, somewhere downstream uh, 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 at, at some point in time. So if you want to sort of view what we're looking at is, you know, our, our model and, and actually physical things that we're working with, we look at what I'll call a system in a package. Uh, these are uh, effectively multi-core types of systems where uh, uh, the, the research in my group is figuring out how to link the cores up using a photonic fabric in order to be able to move the data around at light speed uh, at very high bandwidth. Uh, we're looking at different types of, of memory, and our mantra is that uh, we, we, we store data using ions. Uh, and so these are the, the, the memristor crossbars that maybe you've heard about. But uh, what I'll be talking about here is really what, uh, uh, another aspect of the work that we're doing, and that is accelerators. So we, we view uh, uh, building uh, accelerator systems on these, on these chips. You know, the processors, other people will essentially take care of those, but the processors we're looking at are different types of systems. For instance, massive cross uh, uh, vector matrix multiplication systems. You heard uh, a couple of times about how important that is. And so if we can do a, a vector matrix multiplication essentially in one effective clock tick uh, uh, and, 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 and get some uh, uh, answer out from that. That's, that's one way of doing it. But then what I'm going to talk about uh, the rest of my talk today is a different type of device called a neurister. And this is an electronic analog uh, of a neuron. Uh, all of this work that we're doing in terms of the cog cognition is really piggybacking uh, on the work that we're doing to commercialize a, a memory based upon uh, memristor devices. And so we're doing a lot of work uh, with, with partners of various, of, of various groups, including uh, a Sandia here, but we're designing uh, 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 
mixed or hybrid circuitry involving devices, nano devices of various types that sit on top of CMOS so that we can essentially uh, uh, get a, a significant acceleration in the, in the capacity out of the CMOS uh, uh, using these circuits. And it turns out that, that the same fundamental structure, a crossbar structure, is what we're using for, for memory and all of the different types of, of logic uh, circuits that we're using. So it's, it's uh, all the same tools, all the same uh, uh, basic structure essentially apply to the same, uh, uh, to, to all of these ideas. And so we're, we're able to get a, a lot of reuse of things that we discover from the memory program. So uh, since my talk is already over, uh, what I'll do is I'll give you the takeaway messages first. Uh, and then I'll try to, uh, to go through and, 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 and uh, uh, just amplify a few of the points. First of all, the main thing, and I'll just state this, I, I, I hope that it's actually obvious to everybody, but biological circuits and signals are extraordinarily nonlinear. They are mind-bendingly nonlinear. And the issue is that nonlinear network theory is practically not practiced. Uh, very few people actually have any familiarity with or have ever utilized or understood nonlinear network theory. And so here we are, we're trying to figure out the operation of an extraordinarily complex uh, uh, black box without understanding the first principles of what's involved. Uh, there's actually an extraordinarily high information content in these nonlinear systems. And the, the, the interesting issue is, uh, given some of the, the, the simplistic models we have, it's not even uh, evident whether that complexity uh, is even important or not. Uh, you know, it's, it's potentially there, it's, it's available at some level, but is it actually used? We don't know. Another interesting issue is that biological systems appear to be poised right on the edge of chaos. In other words, if you, if you essentially just tweak the, 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 the place where a biological system is, is uh, uh, biased, you will essentially go in from a, from a very, very highly nonlinear but deterministic system into a completely chaotic system. And the question about that is, why? Why does, the bio, why does biology take such a risk to put us right on the boundary of chaos? Well, one answer is that's because where the information content and the signals is the highest. There's actually another answer. It turns out that that's also the place where the power consumption is lowest. And so, you know, are we actually using that information or not? I view that as an open question. So I'll try to also talk about the neurister. The neurister is an electronic analog of a Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. It's a uh, inorganic and electronic system that does something very, very similar to uh, uh, an actual neuron. Uh, it's, it uses uh, electronic channels instead of ionic channels and capacitors in order to perform uh, and, and, and create action potentials. It has a very rich spiking behavior and it's completely CMOS compatible. In fact, it uses the same materials that we use in our memories. Uh, it, it's, it's based on memristors. So, the transi so, so you know, there's a question, and it's, this was asked yesterday, could this be actually a transistor equivalent for neuromorphic circuits? It's, a, it's an alternate type of active device uh, that, uh, uh, you know, does the same type of thing that neurons and brains do. So, so this is actually a very active part of our research program. Okay, so first of all, how can nonlinear network analysis help with understanding the connectome? Well, I, I just mentioned this. Nonlinear systems are very, very information rich. Uh, so what are you conceptually missing if you study uh, a, a brain circuit and you are implicitly thinking that it's a linear system, which is the, what the vast majority of people do? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're missing, but I'll just give an example. One is the delta y uh, transition. If you're working with linear impedances, you know that if you have a black box with three outputs, you can't tell if the inside of the box is wired up as a delta or a y. It turns out that if any of those elements is nonlinear, it, uh, uh, you, you actually cannot make an equivalent circuit. So nonlinearity in the system actually allows you to distinguish between the two 
uh, uh, cases, and in fact, it's impossible to build one uh, uh, in terms of the other using a, a particular set of, of, of devices. Okay? So there's a lot more information available in the signals coming out that allow you to distinguish between different types of, of systems. And the reason for that is that nonlinear devices are not, are, are not commutative. So uh, you, you know, if you operate on, 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 on a signal with a, with a nonlinear device and then a different one, you get a different answer if you, if you switch the two devices around, okay? This is something that uh, I have not seen anyone working on uh, neural networks, I mean, uh, you know, actual brain types of systems ever mention. Uh, so where, is, where do you actually find all of this? Well, it turns out that the theory of nonlinear networks has actually been well, def well, well, well worked out. Uh, Leon Chua uh, spent an entire decade of his life, the 1960s, uh, uh, researching and casting uh, lit, uh, uh, essentially network theory into a, 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 a rigorous mathematical framework uh, for nonlinear systems. And in fact, he's called the father of nonlinear net network theory. The issue is that nobody uses it. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, when he wrote his, his book, the introduction to nonlinear non network theory that was published in 1969, it was 987 pages long. This is not a light read. And in fact, anyone who's ever read any of Leon's papers knows it's like mining for gold in Alaska. You've got to sift through tons of ore to get one gram of gold. But it's there. And, the, and, and so that's, that's the issue. So, so very few engineers have ever utilized the methods or concepts of nonlinear network theory, even though they're, they're, they're accessible and available. Uh, there's just so much material to swallow, it's just not an easy introduction. Uh, also, a lot of things that, that Leon came up with really aren't, you don't really need them because you've got SPICE. And SPICE actually will, will handle nonlinear systems, at least mildly nonlinear systems numerically, and so people can get away without actually sort of having a, a deep understanding of these systems. But the problem is, I claim, is that you don't get any intuition out of that. You, you're missing a lot from a spice simulation because you just don't have the gut level feel for what's going on. And the other issue is that actual circuit designers do everything they possibly can to avoid nonlinearity in their circuits because they're just scared like crazy that they're going to go chaotic on them. And, and they will and they do. And so that's a, that, 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 that is an issue. And so most people just avoid nonlinearity. They, they don't want to think about it. But on the other hand, you know, what you're given is a nonlinear system. And so that's, that's an interesting issue. Now, one of the nonlinear devices that, have, that came out of uh, Leon's, uh, or w a concept for a nonlinear device that came out of Leon's research was the memristor. So um, um, I'm hoping that most of you have at least heard of this. Uh, it's a, a, a type of device that essentially depends upon state, right? And so uh, the, the normal memristor that, that people think about, you think about it in terms of a synapse, is a device that stores a bit of information because there is some physical part of the device that changes uh, with time and, you, and, and, and that essentially generates a memory in the system. So there's, there's two fundamental equations that describe a memristor. One is essentially a form of Ohm's law, a state-dependent form of Ohm's law. And then there's a dynamical equation that describes how the, the state variable or the variables that describe the, the change in state change in time. So this, this was, was one of the things that came out of Leon's uh, 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 studies of nonlinearity. Well, recently, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, George Boryanov even had a, had a, 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 a reference to, to, to this. Uh, Leon essentially uh, uh, advanced or, or generalized his ideas to include what he calls locally active memristors. So what's a locally active memristor? Uh, it's a device that actually displays negative differential resistance. And so if you bias it appropriately, you, you can, you can uh, use it to, to, to actually build oscillators or get gain. All right? So the memory, it, it, it turns out, is, a, is transient. It's volatile, if you will. And there's an example, uh, a, a simple example, of a, of a system with, with a negative di differential resistance. And that's a Mott insulator to metal transition. This has been known for a very long time. In the 19, early 1960s at Bell Labs, before, you know, there, was people, there were people at Bell Labs who thought that, that they could actually build circuits that would be better than transistor circuits if they used MOT transitions, if they used an insulator to metal transition. So there's a lot of work back then that went on, but eventually you know, the integrated circuit came, came along and just sort of blew all of that off the, off the map. 
Uh, however, the idea is still interesting because if you have a, a MOT transition, you have an insulator to metal transition, which is effectively a bulk system and doesn't require doping. And so instead of, as, as, as devices get very, very small, you don't have to worry so much about the statistics of dopant atoms if you've got a bulk insulator to, tra uh, insulator to metal transition. So the scaling of, of, of a switch based upon something like this should go to very, very much smaller volumes than you could with a, with a semiconductor type of system, for instance. Uh, I, I showed uh, uh, just uh, uh, about a year ago that uh, you could cast this uh, uh, MOT transition, this insulator to metal transition, in terms of uh, me uh, memristor uh, equations, uh, Leon Chua type memristor equations. And so I won't go, go into too much of that, but what I want to point out is if you have a system that, has, that goes, undergoes a thermal transition, from an insulator to a metal, when you start pushing current through that device, it, it warms up. And eventually what will happen is it will get hot enough that you'll have a transition from the uh, insulating state to the metal state. And so what, you know, the, the way it happens is you actually form a filament of, of conducting material, and as you increase the, the, the current, the size of that filament will grow. So you can think of this as essentially as an electron valve. Uh, as you heat the thing up, the valve opens up, you conduct more current. As, as you, you know, decrease the current, the thing uh, uh, closes off, the resistance in, in, uh, 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 increases. Or, or you can call that an, an electron channel. So this is a, a, a valve or it's a switch for electrons. Now what does that look like? Well, it turns out that it looks almost exactly like the ion channel that's in the uh, 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 cell wall of a, of, of a neuron or an axon. And in fact, it has many of the same properties. Uh, uh, another issue is that Leon Chua has essentially shown that ion channels uh, in, in, in neurons are memristors. They're ion memristors. So you can take uh, one of these uh, devices, uh, one of these uh, uh, locally active memristors, and just put it in a very simple circuit with a capacitor, hook it up with, uh, with, with a DC bias, and the thing will just self-oscillate. All right. And so you can build a Pearson-Anson oscillator using nothing other than one of these locally uh, active memristors and a capacitor without having a, uh, an inductor in the circuit. And the reason that you can do that is the memristor, this locally active memristor, is a nonlinear device, and it actually has a positive reactance, right? This is something that, that, that if, you've you know, if you've sort of studied uh, normal uh, circuit theory, you think that the only thing that has a, has a positive reactance is an inductor coil. Well, when you, get in, when you get out of linear circuit theory, you get into nonlinear systems, you find out that memristors also have a positive reactance, so you can get uh, free-running oscillators with no magnetic fields, no magnetic systems. Uh, we've, we've actually measured and, and uh, uh, simulated the performance of these devices, and the devices that we have in hand now uh, actually uh, can switch in less than seven tenths of a nanosecond, uh, and they have a, 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 an energy to switch of 60 femtojoules. Uh, we think very, very, it should be very easily for us to get down to about 10 picosecond switching times and six femtojoules with, with uh, materials that we have in hand. And we're trying to look at, at, at alternative materials and structures that will get us down into the uh, uh, few picosecond time frames and add a joule uh, energies. I don't think that's, a, that's actually going to be uh, 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 too difficult. So now, uh, what is a neurister? Well, the neurister was originally pos uh, uh, postulated by Hewitt Crane uh, in 1960 as part of his master's thesis at Stanford University. And all he just did was said, wouldn't it be great if we could build an electronic analog of the Hodge Hodgkin-Huxley neuron? If you could do that, you could perform universal computation. So that was, that was his... That was his uh, Stanford PhD thesis. Well, obviously, we've, we've, we've done that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here talking about it. So one thing that Leon Chua has done is he's taken the Hodgkin-Huxley model, and he has essentially put it on a firmer mathematical foundation. What he's done is he's recast it in terms of, of nonlinear uh, circuit analysis. He's shown that the ion and potassium channels are actually memristors, and he's able to essentially uh, 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 actually remove a bunch of anomalies and paradoxes that had to do with, with the original Hodgkin-Huxley model just because uh, of, of weirdness uh, that people weren't, didn't, didn't appreciate because of, of, of these nonlinear systems. Uh, 
So what we have done is we have said, all right, we have a, an electron valve that looks like the ion channel, so we can build a, a similar circuit, not, not identical, but a similar circuit. After all, electrons only come, come in one flavor, so, but we can use two identical memristors in a circuit. We can have two capacitors. The two capacitors can be a little bit different, and you put a, 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 a positive bias on one system, a negative bias on the other system, and, and it turns out that now you've got uh, a device that has uh, uh, all of the properties that, we're, that, that, that people are familiar with in terms of neurons. So, for instance, uh, it has an integrate and fire type of, of capability or threshold. If you put an input pulse into the, the device, which is below threshold, uh, which is uh, uh, shown here, uh, uh, this is a, a, a two-tenths of a volt for this particular uh, device uh, input threshold. What comes out of it is a very, very attenuated pulse. Uh, so you, you essentially have to, uh, uh, within a particular time, you have to exceed a threshold. If you come in with a, a slightly higher pulse, uh, here three-tenths of a volt, the output then is, is a spike. And this spike has a very a significantly larger amplitude, and so you get uh, uh, a... Uh, a uh, uh, gain, uh, a signal gain, and, 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 but you also have uh, uh, this uh, sort of recovery time here that's, that's familiar uh, to people who, who work with neurons. Uh, uh, we can, whoops, I'm sorry, somehow I s uh, Okay, that's interesting. Let me see if I can recover here, I apologize. How's yeah, still on. Are you kidding me? Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's but but it's a but it's a Hitachi uh uh, uh projector. How are we doing? Uh, sorry. I should have brought my my glasses up here is the problem. There you go, okay, sorry. Oh. Okay. So a ver this this very simple circuit here uh, uh, has all of oh thanks. <laughs> so I can actually see. So this very simple circuit here actually has all of the properties of of a of a. Uh, uh, neuron. Unfortunately, I can't show you. There's an animation that I've got that sort of shows you how the, the valves open and close and everything. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, uh, extend too much time now. Uh, uh, we can actually model these devices beautifully with SPICE. So now we actually have a means for, for essentially uh, uh, designing circuits using the standard types of tools that we use for designing uh, semiconductor integrated circuits. Uh, uh, but we can design effectively uh, 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 neuronal types of circuitry uh, using our, our standard semiconductor uh, modeling software. So here is a, a picture which shows uh, uh, measured characteristics of, of, of a neurister uh, compared directly with, with spice simulations of the same thing. And the thing that you see is that simply by changing the, the, the value of the capacitors uh, in, in the system, we can get a very rich type of spiking behavior. You see sometimes we, you know, we can get single spikes, we can change the frequency, we can get multiple spiking or chattering of the systems. And what I was saying earlier about nonlinear systems having a lot of information in them, uh, uh, when you get you know, this, this chattering uh, 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 type of, of spiking is something that's observed uh, uh, fairly frequently in, in, in actual uh, measurements on, on, on brain neurons. And that's uh, a, a very large amount of information that's contained within the uh, 
within, within the uh, uh, actual uh, 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 spikes itself. And so, you know, is, is that information actually used for anything? Well, I don't know. Uh, we'd like to find out. Uh, there's something called a bifurcation diagram uh, for, these, for these types of devices. And so here, uh, this is a bifurcation diagram for the Hodgkin-Huxley axon. Uh, uh, using uh, experimental data, uh, essentially, to, uh, 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 to show what it looks like. And then here is the same uh, type of diagram for our neurister. And what you see is that there is a threshold. So uh, as you bias this system with current, for instance, you, you reach a threshold at which, at which the system will start spiking. And then if you push the bias up too high, then it will stop spiking. All right? And in between, there is a range where, where the, the, the nurister will, 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 will spike. And the interesting thing about the nurister is that uh, the amplitude of the spikes, this is the maximum of the, of, of the spike amplitude, that's the minimum, is pretty much constant over the entire range. So that's kind of an interesting issue. For, a, uh, uh, for, an, for an actual neuron, it turns out that it's a little bit different. But also what, what Leon has noticed is that actual uh, biological neurons, if you look at the data, these things are essentially biased right here, right up next to the, this threshold value for spiking. And, uh, and Leon has also shown that if you're essentially right on this area where there's, an air, there, there's a region of, of, of phase space, if you will, right near this area where the system will go chaotic. And for whatever reason, biology wants to be biased. Your brain is biased right up next to the region of chaos, okay? So one way of thinking about this is, all right, if you go over this, uh, in, into this region of chaos, that's an, ep an epileptic, um, epileptic fit, all right? Uh, but, but somehow the brain wants to be there. And, and the question is, is it, is it there? Because, in fact, that's where the signals will contain the maximum amount of energy, I mean, the maximum amount of information, or is it there because that also happens to be the region where the signals require the least amount of energy. The power, the, the power dissipation is the lowest. So there's, a, there, uh, there's an issue here. Leon actually tends to believe that, that the information content is important, uh, it, it, but it may be a, a complete red herring. It could just be that, 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 it, that it's a, a, a power minimization. So uh, as a summary for the Nerister, it's an electronic and inorganic Hodgkin-Huxley unit. So we've, in, in what I've shown you, we've built an, a nerister using two locally active memristors and two capacitors as the dynamical element. There's four state variables, same as Hodgkin-Huxley. Uh, 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 we've observed signal gain, thresholding, attenuations, and spiking that very closely mimics uh, 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 neuron action potentials, except, of course, we're going much faster, you know, uh, uh, because of the, of, of, of the electronic nature, uh, we're, we're going anywhere from, from, from three to six orders of magnitude faster in terms of our spiking, but we can actually dial down the energy per spike to be less than what you see in a biological neuron. Now, total power consumption, if you're going six orders of magnitude faster, would be higher, but in terms of energy per uh, uh, operation, if you will, energy per spike, we can actually go much lower than, a, than uh, using, using a neurister than, a, than a, a, a biological neuron can go. And so we're designing and simulating a transistor, transistorless digital and analog logic circuits based upon uh, the neurister units. And uh, I'm, I'm way out of time, so I'm just going to go all the way to the, to, the at, to the end here. We've actually designed up and shown that we can uh, uh, build a cellular automata uh, using, using these devices, and we're in, we're in the process of laying these things out uh, so that we can uh, actually try to, to, to build some of these things and see that they work. But uh, thank you very much for your attention. Not in the Mercer field, but one thing I'm very curious about: what can you say about lifetime expectancies for the for the memristors? Are there are there issues with lifetime because of the transi phase transitions? Okay, so uh, for the for the particular memristors that I'm talking about here, the the ones that are that are active devices, uh, it turns out that the that, that the memory lifetime in these devices is. Uh, well, depending, it, it, it can be, you know, no more than, than a few picoseconds, 
uh, so, 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 so these, are, so, so these are, are intentionally not used as memory elements. They're, in, they're, they're used as active devices and amplifiers, if you will. So uh, you know, using a, for, for a synapse, you would use a different type of, of, of memristor, a non-locally active or, or a, a, a device that is, is intentionally non-volatile to actually store data. So those are, that's a different type of device. It's actually built using similar chemical compounds, transition metal oxides, and those, uh, uh, you know, depending upon what you want, can hold state anywhere from, from, from minutes to, to centuries. Oh, oh, you mean, oh, I, I see, you're talking about the endurance. All right, so we have actually run these things for weeks at a time without observing much in the way of degradation. So we have, we, you know, we have, we've connected these things up, uh, sort of gone, gone away for a weekend, come back, or gone away on, you know, for, for, for some period of time and, and come back and looked at them, uh, and, and they're still oscillating. Their character does change a little bit. There is, uh, this transition is thermally activated, and so for the particular materials that we're using, the temperatures are kind of high, and so they, they will, uh, 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 you know, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long niobium dioxide would last. That's also not the, 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 the primary material that we would use. We're actually looking to find materials that actually have a, a transition temperature that's much lower that'll, that'll, actually, that'll actually allow us to have a, a much smaller switching energy and, and, and uh, uh, less uh, impact on, on the... Uh, uh, on the endurance of the system.